ain't done, so I got to give her a plug. Yeah. Okay. But with the Petersons, the Kirklands, the Lots, the Gaskins, they're the ones that got it started. Uh, we have a Mrs. Lucinda Lott who's buried out there. It says 1948, but we think she was moved there because mm -hmm. David Kirkland is actually the, the very first person buried in okay. our cemetery. Okay. Now, at the time that the two and a half acres that the black community were using mm -hmm. their, their acreage, the whites expanded on out into 25 more acres. And now there's no black, no white. It's it all does. it's all together. It's all one cemetery, mm -hmm. and we're a little over 50 acres. Uh, we've got a lot more to be done out mm -hmm. there, but it's come a long way, and we're really proud of our cemetery. I, uh, you ought to be. Y'all have done an excellent job. We got to give the mayor and commissioners, and I'm talking all the way back to Max Lockwood, mm -hmm. uh, credit for what they have allowed us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was times there, I'm sure they didn't want to see me show up <laughs> at a city council meeting, but I mean, the cemetery is not the m most appetizing thing in the world you want to talk to, about, but that's our history. And that, we all go there heritage. eventually. Yeah. Eventually we're going to show up there, yeah. Uh, I am aficionado of cemeteries and graveyards because you learn so much about the people, not only by their headstones, but their lives and everything. And I have been to cemeteries all over the world, Europe and everywhere, and ours is always immaculate. I noticed that when I was out there that today, I attended a service out there today, and everything is just pristine. And y'all do an excellent job of that, Henry. Excellent. Well, Proud well, of you. Well, I thank you, but it's a, it's a group effort. Right. I've got a uh, very good guard that brings a prison work detail mm -hmm. from Alma four days a week. Uh, they're there for about five hours a day, four mm -hmm. days a week. His name is James Seals, and I want to give a plug to yeah. him. He, he helps. He brings in good young men, and we teach them a trade out yeah. there. And they're proud of it. They, they, when they leave, they know how to restore and preserve mm -hmm. markers and headstones. Mm -hmm. They know how to take care of grounds. They can landscape. Uh, it, it's a good it's thing. something felt to follow through with. Yeah, it is. Uh, there was a dig out at the cemetery. Was that just in the black great cemetery area, or did y'all have archaeology dig up things everywhere? We, no, it, that we focused on that section because mm -hmm. we were having problems there. We knew it was full, but mm -hmm. we had to prove it. And the first step was Dr. Trinkley. Okay. The next thing we did, and Dr. Trinkley, they used a uh, device called a penetrometer. Mm -hmm. And that measures the density of the soil. Okay. If you dig a hole and put the dirt back in, it's not going to be as compacted as right. the land around it. Oh, okay. And that's how they were able to find those graves. They could use that everywhere but in the coped in areas. Mm -hmm. Now, a coped in area has the granite border and then the cement and the gravel, the rock. Right. Yeah. They couldn't use it there. So we had to go in. We got Southeastern Horizons with Dwight Kirkland. Mm -hmm. Came in. He's an archaeologist. Uh, yes. We worked with him for about three months. And we literally went in and, and took everything out, shaved the area down to where we could either prove or disprove there was a grave there. Mm -hmm. We found arrowheads. We found graves. We found. I mean, when you start digging in a cemetery, you, find you, stuff. you never know what you're going to come <laughs> up with. But Dwight did us a great job, and uh, that's when we were finally able to get closure on that section. Okay. But it was just in that section. Okay. Everywhere else, we had documentation of who, not who was buried, but who owned it. Right. But nothing in that old section uh, that, that was run by the McLeans. Mm -hmm. it, they had it listed in their books, but without telling where. Uh, so, so you don't know exactly what mm, spot? No, and we're still trying to, we finally got it all mapped out thanks to uh, Legacy Mark and Mr. Rob Mills out of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. We've got it all mapped uh, and now we're putting names to numbers mm -hmm. and we're going to have that up on a website by the first of the year. Fantastic, yep. that would be wonderful. Yep. Close to 9,000 names. Ooh. Yep. I got, a, I got a question. The mausoleums out there, the older ones especially, does, do y'all have any restrictions now on people building their own mausoleum? Because I know the city has one. Do well, actually the city doesn't. 
Oh, okay. The one on the left as you come in was built by a private group. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm not gonna throw names oh, out, okay. but that's the Dixie Mausoleum. Uh, once it's full, it turns over to the city and it's ours to maintain. Okay. okay. The one on the right was built by a private enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Douglas Community Mausoleum. Okay. Um, Mr. Sparks built mm -hmm. that and it's full and now it's, re it's the responsibility of the city to maintain. Okay. Now as far as crypts and small mm -hmm. mausoleums like the Ashley, right, Ashley Slater, Slater one, you can still do those. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, we most of them aren't walk in now, mm -hmm. they're, they're just, just outside. Right. And uh, I am a, always enamored of the, the creativity people have yeah. with, with their headstones yeah. or tributes. So you, you can go all over Georgia uh, from Bonaventure to mm -hmm. Rome and, and see some really nice stuff. You're not going to see anything any nicer than what we've got. It's gorgeous. A, a lot of that's Italian marble that had to be shipped here mm -hmm. back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, we're, we're very blessed with what we've got there. It tells a history of our community. It does. It does. It's an Very outdoor graphically. museum. It is. Yeah. Uh, my, my granddaughter falls in love with the angels. We go yeah. ride through the cemetery and count the ain't statues of angels. Yeah. And um, some people think that's strange, but if you ever want a peaceful place to get in touch with the Holy Maker, that is one place you can do it. Well, Thank you so much for coming today, and you will be back because I didn't even skim the surface. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you so Thank much. You. Well, today we have Jim Cottingham with us again, and I am so proud of that. Thanks. And we're going to talk about First United Methodist Church in Douglas. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. It's good to be here, Carol. Tell us how the church started. Well, the church started as an outgrowth of a revival in the summer of 1888. Wow. Uh, Douglas was a small community. There were numbers of Methodist churches in the region. There was Oak Grove Methodist Church mm -hmm. up near the river and Lone Hill Methodist Church. Both of them traced their history to some 40 years before then, mm -hmm. but Douglas was just uh, a little hamlet and had a small courthouse and a few uh, dwellings. And um, a series of uh, revival sessions were held at the courthouse right on what's now Peterson Avenue, then <laughs> Jacksonville Street. And uh, they founded the church and they organized on the third Sunday of August, 1888. Five ah, members. Five? Yes, a pastor <laughs> from uh, the Broxton Charge, Reverend Enfinger, came down and helped them organize and was instrumental in the early years of the church, getting them up and going. And he later moved to Douglas. So. Mm -hmm became part of the, the fellowship. That's fantastic. And the first Methodist church built, where was that located? Well, let me, just before okay. the first Methodist church was built in its present location, mm -hmm. there on North Peterson mm -hmm. and North Madison Avenue, it's bordered by Jackson Street and the property goes down to Franklin Street. Uh, the f two previous church dwellings, first was the courthouse. Mm -hmm. They lived, they right. worshiped in the original courthouse. And then the county built another second wooden courthouse. And the first wooden courthouse was moved to the present location about where the chapel is. Okay. There at Madison and Jackson. And worshiped in there for several years in that wooden structure. And it was moved when the new church <laughs> was built in 1906. Okay. And so at that location, and then that, that beautiful structure, there was some mm -hmm. uh, construction problems and it uh, was condemned by the city engineer in the Ooh. 1950s. And they said, this is not safe in all of its aspects. And the church went about uh, 
rebuilding. And so the present sanctuary was uh, built and dedicated uh, Palm Sunday, 1960. Okay. So it's kind of hard to believe, but uh, we've worshiped in the new sanctuary, the 1960 yeah. sanctuary, longer than, than any <laughs> other place. <laughs> Seems new and fresh to us, and we think of it as the new sanctuary, but it's... Was, uh was there anything from the 1906 building that was saved or, or gone? Oh my goodness, yes. The, uh, the, from the 1906 building, there's some beautiful stained glass windows. Uh, one is in the balcony on the mm -hmm. west end of the sanctuary. Beautiful uh, 1906 window there. Over in the social hall and in different places of the church are other stained glass windows that were preserved and restored and uh, moved uh, there. So we're, we're very grateful for that. And it's real reminders of those who went on before and mm -hmm. made a lot of uh, gifts and sacrifices and uh, just sort of brought us to, to where we are. Also, at the, um, when you leave the sanctuary headed over toward the fellowship hall is the original marble cornerstone of the 1906 church. Oh. So it was placed in there very, probably maybe 40 or 50 feet from where it uh, earlier resided mm -hmm. for those decades, but it was uh, installed in the wall there. You really can't go by there without seeing that uh, beautiful structure. You remember when Glenn Clower was here this yes. summer for that yes. wonderful Rogers studio. Yeah. So this is sort of a way to date the history of the church. Uh, his wife-to-be, Nancy Rogers, right. grew up in the Methodist Church. They began dating when he was a student at South Georgia College and after this and that and a few other things, <laughs> they're getting married in 1960. Theirs was going to be the first wedding in the new sanctuary. Uh, things were delayed, <laughs> <laughs> so they actually were married in the social hall. <laughs> And uh, when he was here for the mm -hmm. Rogers Studio exhibit, we went by and took a peek at that, uh, <laughs> at that little uh, spot for that 1906 thing was that uh, uh, sort of marked a transition from where we were to where we were headed. And so amazing. it's fine. And, but people have a, a physical connection and uh, it's so wonderful. People have marvelous experiences in churches. Mm -hmm. I know your earlier guest was uh, talking with you about cemeteries. Right. But uh, that's, that's wonderful. But when you think of the uh, changes in life that we go through and the, the experiences we have in churches, it's just extraordinary and often a, a sense of place. It becomes mm -hmm. very sacred and very meaningful to us. There was a parsonage on that property at one time, correct? There, <laughs> I <laughs> think there was. <laughs> yes, there was. One was built there for the church in 1900. Mm -hmm. And another one was, uh, the. it was later just picked up and moved around the corner and it's now on Jackson Street, down oh. and over. And a little farther down, another parsonage, when that one was moved aside mm -hmm. for the social hall, another uh, parsonage, um, was moved in the late 1970s, I think, sometime mm -hmm. in the mid to late 1970s, and it's over on Golf Club Road, so the residence yes. of Ed and Linda Bagwell. Bagwell. So th those two uh, those two parsonages were there, and uh, wonderful structures. They serve families through the years, and um, they're still and there. In new locations. <laughs> yep. That's right. Yep. And you've expanded now. You have the daycare and the parking lot, and all that's nice. It's just a gorgeous facility. Yeah. Well, we're we're very grateful for that, and it's uh, been a lot of change. And every time we've looked at doing anything, mm -hmm. we just said, how can we? Uh, position ourselves for ministry and mm -hmm. outreach and service. Um, one of the recent expansions, the church purchased uh, what used to be the uh, Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. Industrial Development mm -hmm. uh, office there that uh, faced there on uh, Peterson Avenue, and that's called the Refuge. It's the youth house. That's one of the oh, places. Okay. Uh, 
we need additional space. You uh, Sunday school class, Sunday school class, yes. Sunday school. <laughs> Sooner or later, you say, "Hey, where are we all going to meet?" The the youth meet there, and that's also the location of our church's food pantry. Oh, okay. There's a ministry called Our Daily Bread, and once a month, uh, volunteers of the church meet there to mm -hmm. uh, distribute uh, food services to those in need. So we're we're grateful for that, and that became possible because of the 